I do. I would like to introduce our uh, next presenter. Um, our next presenter is um, Dr. Tom Rothstein. He is the founding chair of the Department of Investigative Medicine here at WMed. Um, Dr. Rothstein joined the medical school in 2016, um, and he has served as the assistant dean for investigative medicine and has led the growth of the medical school's laboratory-based research, um, which is outstanding, um, if you can see pictures of that um, laboratory, um, including four principal investigators who joined the team, more than um, even more than a dozen staff members. And I do re recall the staff members joining um, our team and they were mainly from uh, New York. So that was exciting to, to see um, you know, uh, a team of uh, different diverse groups of members from Dr. Rothstein's team. Um, he also has taken advantage of research training at the National, um, uh, National Cancer Institute and the Massachusetts um, Institute of Technology. Dr. Rothstein has worked as a professor of medicine, microbiology, immunobiology at Boston University School of Medicine, Boston Medical Center. So now I introduce to you, um, Mr. Dr. Tom Rothstein. Dr. Rothstein. Thank you, Candace. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, great. Um, I appreciate that very kind uh, introduction. Um, that was a fantastic uh, video. Uh, so uh, thank you, Mr. Jackson. Um, it, uh, it took my breath away because it also um, presented in a very concise form everything that I want to talk about. So it's, I want to get into that fabulous movie that Mr. Jackson alluded to. It's been a great adventure for me. And uh, with your indulgence, I'd like to share a little bit about what I've learned uh, in, in preparing for, for this, uh, this Black History Month presentation. So I'm gonna see if I can share my screen. I don't work with Zoom, so I hope it works. Let's see what happens. Is it working? Can you see my first slide, which is... Has a title, great, thank you. It looks great. Um, so, you know, I've broken the, my presentation up into three pieces. Uh, one on the origin and use of, of HeLa cells. One on the development of the salt polio vaccine, which is a great story that was already alluded to in the video. And uh, one on the strange situation in which uh, HeLa cells were for many years uh, said to be derived from a patient named Helen Lane, not Henrietta Lacks. So uh, Henrietta Lacks was, was first examined by Dr. Howard W. Jones Jr. Uh, at Hopkins. And this is a, a paper that he published um, years later about his first interactions with Henrietta Lacks. Uh, he saw her four months after the birth of her fifth child. She was seen for spotting at that time. Uh, in 1951, Hopkins was one of the few leading hospitals that served Blacks as stipulated by Mr. Johns Hopkins in his will, but it was segregated at the time. Jones at that time was a junior faculty member who later became famous for his work in in vitro fertilization. He commented that the lesion was unlike any he had ever seen. And he says in this article, he had seen over a thousand by that time. It was the size of a 25 cent piece and it was soft and not hard like a carcinoma and purple. A biopsy taken at that time indicated later that it was undifferentiated epidermoid carcinoma of the cervix. Uh, within eight days, uh, radium implants were uh, provided uh, to the patient. And it was at that time uh, 
that a sample was taken and given to Dr. Gay. Um, Dr. Uh, Jones commented that it was very unusual in follow-up that the tumor did not shrink or shrivel at all from the radium implants, which typically occurs, but instead it spread relentlessly. Uh, the patient suffered greatly with ureteral obstruction and other complications and sadly died within six months. Now, at that time, there was much debate regarding the nature of epithelial, intraepithelial carcinoma. Uh, was it morphologically, it was morphologically abnormal, but was it invasive? And it was hypothesized that uh, grow, in vitro growth characteristics might distinguish it. The invasive cells might grow uh, more rapidly or more extensively. Uh, so that by the in vitro growth characteristics might tell you whether it was normal or invasive carcinoma or something in between. And so there was already a collaboration between the OBGYN group where Dr. Jones was located and Dr. Gay, who was an innovator in tissue culture and developed the roller bottle technique. And um, he devised Gay's Balanced Salt Solution, which you can still buy as Gay's Balanced Salt Solution. His name is attached to it. By 1951, this collaboration had yielded 30 samples that had been examined and none of them showed any growth in, in the laboratory. At the same time, Gay also had an interest in developing a human cell line, but human cells in the lab only survived a few days. They never were, could be maintained continuously. So the tissue from Henrietta Lacks was quite unusual because it not only survived for a few days, but it survived continuously. Now, you know, I have to laugh a little bit because the medium that was initially grown in was a combination that Gay concocted of chicken plasma, bovine embryo extract, and human placental cord serum. I don't know how he ever came up with that. But in fact, HeLa cells grow well in commonly defined medium that we have in, in every laboratory. It's not clear why these cells were, were different. It's been speculated that maybe they had overactive telomerase, but it's very hard to know because uh, the uh, HeLa cells have a, a super normal number of chromosomes. They were named HeLa according to the lab convention at the time, which was to use the first two letters of the first name and the first two letters of the last name. Now, Gay uh, provided HeLa cells to investigators all over the world. He did that even before he published them. And so there was never a patent or profit to Dr. George Gay and Hopkins never patented uh, those cells. I don't know if they regret it, but they never did patent it. And so no funds ever came to Hopkins or to Gay for that cell, for those cells. Uh, however, as I think everyone recognizes their extensive use in academic laboratories and by the pharmaceutical industry has yielded billions and billions of dollars in profits for someone. So why are HeLa cells so important? Um, so they were the first cells, as I mentioned, capable of living outside the body for an extended period of time. They proliferate rapidly. Their doubling time is about 24 hours and their replication is unlimited. So some cells will divide a couple of times and then peter out and die, but HeLa cells can, can divide and continue to divide with no restriction on the number of generations. Uh, they are still dividing in, in, in laboratories all over the world. They're simple to maintain in standard culture medium. They're very sturdy in nature. They're viable in the face of perturbations. They have many, many characteristics similar to primary cells. And as the video pointed out, um, they've been sent to space 
because they are so similar to normal cells that if you want to get an idea of what, it, what will happen to normal cells in space, that's a good way to do it. If you want to get an idea of what a chemotherapy will do to cells, HeLa cells would be your, your go-to for that, um, et cetera. In addition, they're easily transfected, which facilitates molecular biology experiments. And I just checked um, a couple of days ago, we published a paper last year on protein aggregation. Uh, and in that paper, yep, we used HeLa cells because they were easy to transfect and we could grow them very readily. And so they are the go-to uh, cell for many, many kinds of studies. Uh, in fact, when Cheryl first asked me about this and suggested that maybe I should talk about um, why HeLa cells are so useful, I said, well, that, that's like trying to explain why cars are so useful. I mean, they're useful for everything. And we use them to go to the store. We use them to go out to dinner. We use them to go to the library. Um, and that's what HeLa cells are. They, they are the most ubiquitous, most commonly used cell for all kinds of studies. And, and let me show you a little bit about that. This chart compiled by NIH shows the number of publications involving HeLa cells year by year, starting in 1953. And you can see that it started off kind of slow, but then sort of increased exponentially. And currently the number of studies that have utilized HeLa cells ex exceeds 110,000. This shows the variety of scientific areas in which HeLa cells have been uh, an important driver of new investigation. And it's an incredibly diverse uh, variety of areas, including, as was mentioned in the video, cancer studies, signaling studies, studies of development, studies of genetics, studies of microscopy, and, and it goes on. My own field, immunology uh, and virology, which we'll talk about later. All of these different areas and each bar represents the number of papers published utilizing HeLa cells. So 2,200 for immunology, um, 4,700 for drug delivery, um, 6,000 for virology. I mean, that is a lot of work that has been advanced with the support and the utilization of HeLa cells. And it's not just in the United States. As this map shows in the different colors, the darker color represents 10,000 or more papers, five to 10,000 papers, one to 5,000 papers, et cetera. You can see HeLa cells are utilized by laboratories all over the world. Or as was said in the video, or, or maybe Mr. Jackson said this, I can't remember. Um, they can, they are, they have been grown to such an extent that they would extend around the circumference of the earth three times. So uh, it's really, really quite remarkable what they have done to advance scientific progress. But you know, it it hasn't all been been good, um, and I just want to mention one or two other. Uh, aspects uh, uh, of the use of HeLa cells. Um, one involves what I would call pseudo-clinical research. So uh, Dr. Chester Southam injected HeLa cells, this was mentioned in the video, into patients with dementia who obviously could not consent uh, to see if the immune system would reject the cancer. Uh, sorry, in 1963, uh, three doctors refused to help, resigned their positions, and alerted the public, perhaps remembering the Nuremberg Code, which was developed in 1947. Southam was found guilty of fraud, deceit, and unprofessional conduct, 
and placed on probation for one year. He later was elected president of the American Association for Cancer Research. I think there's a commentary about the nature of our society in there somewhere. Uh, in addition, uh, the, there, has been, there have been complications in the laboratory. In 1967, it was discovered that 18 independently derived cell lines were in fact HeLa cells on the basis of G6PD isoenzymes. And this was published in an NCI monograph, which is an, one example of how sometimes the most important work is not published in the most important journals. Now this led to a multi-decade battle over the validity of published work on cell lines set, said to represent a particular tissue. So people who, were work, who had published work saying that they had studied adrenal cells or kidney cells or pituitary cells, then someone comes along in 1967 and says, these weren't, these weren't pituitary cells you were studying, these were HeLa cells. These weren't adrenal cells you were studying, these are HeLa cells. As you can see, uh, reputations were uh, sullied, and so this was very controversial for a while. And yet, as late as 1988, 18% of cell lines thought to be something else were found to be HeLa cells. And this is because the HeLa cells proliferate so rapidly and are so hardy and can actually float for short distances so that if you're not really careful with your tissue culture work, they can land in a different tissue culture plate and contaminate a cell line that you were studying. In, 19, in 2007, NIH issued a notice on authentication of cultured cells and a statement on authentication is now required for all NIH grant applications. But I don't wanna end on a negative note because HeLa cells were integral, not only to many discoveries, but the highest quality studies that were awarded Nobel Prize. And so this, here are three Nobel Prizes that were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine to two groups in 2008 and 2009, and the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2014. And I checked, if you look at on PubMed, at publications by each of these authors, uh, they each used HeLa cells in their work. So uh, this isn't you know one investigator among a group used HeLa cells. All nine of these investigators published work with HeLa cells. All three of these Nobel Prizes critically depend on the contribution of HeLa cells. So now uh, the, uh, the story sort of takes a turn, or I want to take it, want it to take a turn uh, south to Tuskegee University. Uh, and that was mentioned uh, briefly uh, also in the video. So uh, Tuskegee University started as Tuskegee Normal School. Booker T. Washington, a famed uh, educator, was the first principal of uh, the Tuskegee Normal School and grew it to the Tuskegee Institute, which later became Tuskegee University. And one of his triumphs was to recruit uh, the very well-known scientist, uh, George Washington Carver. Uh, now, George Washington Carver uh, apparently was also a little bit of a temperamental scientist. Uh, he threatened to leave uh, Tuskegee at, on at least three separate occasions. But as most people are aware, he was uh, a brilliant scientist. Uh, when I learned about him in elementary school, uh, he was said to study peanuts, but in fact, what he was doing was advocating crop rotation so that the crops weren't always cotton and didn't always deplete the soil. Booker T. Washington was the first uh, black man invited to the White House uh, by Teddy Roosevelt in 1901. George Washington Carver received 
fame in many ways. He received the first patent for soy milk. He developed a formula for peanut and soy milk. Sadly, he was way ahead of his time uh, on that. Um, he was not a PhD himself, but was awarded a number of honorary doctorates and was one of the few Americans elected to the Royal Society of Arts in England. He established the Carver Research Foundation uh, in his will. And I just want to call attention, I put a, a little red arrow here. This is not Dr. Carver uh, sipping a soda during lunch. For those of us of a certain age, we remember that this is how we used to pipette before pipette men were invented. We used to mouth pipette. So uh, that's what he's doing in, in this photo. Now, this story interweaves with the fight against polio. And here are a few posters uh, regarding uh, the fight against polio and raising funds for the March of Dimes. In the first half of the 20th century, polio afflicted on average 25,000 children each year, uh, crippling many of them for life. Now, it's strange that in our present pandemic situation, 25,000 doesn't sound like a lot. We have sadly suffered 500,000 deaths in this country. But the thinking about polio was, was emotional because um, first of all, it came in waves. 25,000 was the average, but it came in an epidemic wave. So in the South, from time to time, there would be many more than 25,000 children in a localized part of the country. And of course, it was also emotional because young children were dying and young children were, uh, were crippled for life. So how is it that HeLa cells and Tuskegee uh, joined forces in the fight against a polio? So for that, I have to go back to uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, Franklin Roosevelt was, uh, he had been assistant secretary of the Navy during World War I. He was a vice presidential candidate in 1920. In 1928, he was elected governor of New York. And in 1932, as we know, he was elected president during the Great Depression. But in between those times, in 1921, at age 39, he was afflicted with polio. And he never walked by himself again. Now, at that time, uh, hydrotherapy was recommended for patients with polio, and there was a hydro an important hydrotherapy site at Warm Springs, Georgia. Warm Springs was about an hour and a half from Tuskegee, about the same as Ann Arbor and the University of Michigan from here. Uh, Roosevelt subsequently bought Warm Springs himself in 1926 and established the first hospital for polio. And he established with his law partner, uh, Basil O'Connor, um, the Warm Springs Foundation. But the Warm Springs Foundation and Warm Springs accepted only white patients. There were blacks on the staff, but the patients were only white. So Roosevelt and O'Connor withdrew from the Warm Springs Foundation and established the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, which later became the March of Dimes. Basil O'Connor, as president of the NFIP, then established the Tuskegee Infantile Paralysis Center in 1941 at Tuskegee Institute. And this was facilitated by the pre-existing Andrews Hospital and the Carver Research Foundation that I mentioned that George Washington Carver established in his will. And Carver himself had worked on uh, peanut oil um, for massaging uh, affected limbs. Uh, this uh, Tuskegee Infantile Paralysis Institute uh, served black children and also employed and trained black physicians who could then go to other areas of the country 
and treat um, black children. So the, the NFIP through its funding uh, supported the Tuskegee Center, but the NFIP at that time also funded Jonas Salk in his effort to develop the polio vaccine. And around that time, uh, Basil O'Connor recruited Charles Bynum uh, to uh, direct a new department focused on outreach activities. And Bynum was the first black executive of a national uh, foundation. So the salt vaccine was scheduled for clinical trials, but how are they going to measure the response? We're familiar with that with the COVID vaccine. How do we do the clinical trial? And so what they wanted to do was administer the vaccine, uh, take a blood sample, and see whether antibodies had been developed in the vaccine recipient that would be capable of blocking the poliovirus from infecting cells. Well, the, the go-to cell for that at the time were rhesus monkey kidney cells, but it was quickly calculated that the cost for the number of rhesus monkeys to do this would be prohibitive. Now, it had, it had been shown that poliovirus could infect human cells in tissue culture. They, they were not like HeLa cells. They didn't proliferate, but they could be maintained in culture for a couple of days. And that was shown by Do John Enders, Thomas Weller, and Frederick Robbins, and they were awarded the 1954 Nobel Prize in Medicine for that. But about the same time, uh, George Gay and his uh, colleagues uh, showed that um, the polio virus would propagate in HeLa cells, as shown right here. And in fact, they infected HeLa cells more readily than other human cells. So uh, O'Connor, uh, serving as the chair of the board of trustees at Tuskegee University and Bynum, both being very familiar with the outstanding work being done at the Carver Research Institute, then decided that Tuskegee had the capability and the expertise to expand the number of HeLa cells that would be necessary to test all of the samples in these initial clinical studies. And so the NFIP made a grant to Tuskegee and the Carver Research Foundation to Russell Brown as director of the Carver Research Foundation and James Henderson as the co-PI uh, for this effort. And I have to say that when I was looking into this, I was just tickled that Tuskegee was chosen for this important function, not Hopkins. Remember Hopkins is where the HeLa cells were developed, but they didn't go back to George Gay they didn't go back to Hopkins, they didn't go to Harvard, they didn't go to Yale, they went to Tuskegee because they were so impressed with the work that was being done there and because they had already established an institute for infantile paralysis there as well. And this is an early picture of what was then called the Tuskegee HeLa cell factory. And when they started expanding the HeLa cells, they made a number of important discoveries. They discovered the temperature sensitivity of HeLa cells. They design, designed special transportation modules to send HeLa cells all over the country. They developed quality control measures that were then adopted by laboratories uh, all over the United States. And eventually at their peak, shipped over 20,000 tube cultures per week. So this was an amazing accomplishment, both technically, practically, uh, and conceptually. As a result, um, polio was finally brought under control by vaccination. The salt, vac salt vaccine came first. That was a killed virus vaccine, and that's where HeLa cells, in my opinion, had their first and greatest 
clinical triumph. Now, the Sabin vaccine, an oral vaccine, came later in 1962. It, it was given with a sugar cube. It was oral, so administration was easier. And I would guess that uh, there are only a few people on this call of a certain age, such as myself, who ever received the salt vaccine. Uh, most people have received the Sabin vaccine. But I just wanna say that without HeLa cells, without Drs. Brown and Henderson, without the Carver Research Foundation and Tuskegee University, many children, myself included, would not have received the salt polio vaccination when we did. And that's why I feel that the, the role of HeLa cells in the development of the salt polio vaccine was its first and greatest uh, clinical triumph. Now, I just want to touch on, on one other aspect of HeLa cells. So uh, I was first introduced to HeLa cells in 1966 when I was working at, as a, at the GW University Cancer Center. Uh, I was just a toddler at the time. No, just kidding. Um, I was a college student working at, at the GW Cancer Center. And one of the physicians I work with, Dr. Alford, explained to me that HeLa derived from the patient named HeLa Lane. This was like, it was presented to me as this like secret information. You know, now you're a member of the fraternity. You know that HeLa cell stands for Helen Lane. But it wasn't just Dr. Alford or me or the GWU Cancer Center. As late as 1974, an article in Science, one of the, perhaps the leading scientific journal in the United States, started this way. In February 1951, a woman named Helen Lane was being treated for cancer of the cervix at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Helen Lane achieved an unusual measure of immortality. Cells derived from her tumor are still very much alive and with us. So you know who they were talking about, but they said Helen Lane. Later that same year, there was a small correction published in Science, which said this reporter spent a couple of hours tracing the origin of HeLa cells. Helen Lane, it seems, never lived, but Henrietta Lacks did, long protected by the pseudonym Helen Lane. Her true identity was brought to our attention by Victor McCusick, chairman of medicine uh, at Hopkins. Well, I'm not sure who they would be protecting because I'm sure in the, in the city of Baltimore, there must be somebody else named Helen Lane. <laughs> so I'm not sure how that was protecting anybody. So I, you know, I wanna talk a little bit about Helen Lane in the context of those times. Remember, 1951, HeLa cells were first grown in the lab. 52, mass produced at Tuskegee University. 53, they're starting to be used to test batches of polio vaccine. 1954, salt polio vaccine administration began. So 1951, 1954, we're talking about the middle of the last century. We're talking about shortly after the end of World War II. What was it like? Well, in World War II, the armed forces were segregated. Now, in recent years, we've heard about the Tuskegee Airmen, rightly so, but it's important not to forget that it wasn't just the Air Force. The, all of the armed forces were segregated. It wasn't until 1948 that President Truman ended segregation in the armed forces by Order 9981. But it wasn't as simple as that. A year later, he sacked the Secretary of the Army who was forced into retirement because he opposed the segregation of the armed forces. And it wasn't until 1954 that the last segregated all black army unit, 94th Engineer Battalion was deactivated. So now just a little bit closer to home because I'm a hematologist, in World War II, blood donation and administration were segregated uh, by virtue of a one letter designation. That wasn't just the armed forces. 
that included the American Red Cross. And it wasn't until 1950 that the American Red Cross ceased segregating blood donation. Now, as we all know, all donations are not through the American Red Cross. Hospitals uh, uh, obtain donated samples of blood. And Louisiana was the last state to outlaw segregation of blood donation by all facilities. And that didn't occur until 1972. So here's my conspiracy theory, which I will apologize for in advance. This is pure speculation. But is it possible that some people would not have accepted a polio vaccine for their children that was developed with the help of cells from Henrietta Lacks, but would not object to a vaccine developed with the help of cells from Helen Lane. So I may be completely wrong, but the fact that I can construct this seemingly plausible explanation for the use of Helen Lane to correspond to ELA cells says a lot about the condition of our country in the middle of the last century. But, you know, I don't want to end on a negative note. As Martin Luther King Jr. said beautifully, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. 1971, HeLa cell line was established. 1973 was when Lax family members were contacted to obtain blood samples. And I have to say, they weren't contacted to thank them for the contribution that Henrietta Lax had made they were concerned about the contamination of various cell lines by HeLa cells, and they wanted to figure out more genetic markers that they could use to differentiate HeLa cells from other cell types. That, embarrassingly, is actually why they were contacted. But luckily, the story doesn't end there. In 2010, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks was published authored by uh, Rebecca Sklut. In 2013, there was a new NIH policy, uh, as was mentioned in the video, the HeLa genome sequence was published and that posed a HIPAA violation because then we would know about the genomes of her children. And so NIH established a policy to control access to the HeLa genome sequence data and Lax family members are two of the six reviewers on that committee. In 2017, the film of The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lax premiered. Oprah Winf Winfrey starred in that. In 2019, the NIH Office of Science Policy established a website to honor the scientific contributions provided by Henrietta Lax. In 2020, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute made a substantial donation to the Henrietta Lacks Foundation. And also in 2020, Mackenzie Scott donated $20 million to Tuskegee University. But I think most important is that in 2021, Henrietta Lacks and the and HeLa cells are top of mind. And we are all discussing the moral principles and the conundrums that accompany her turbocharged scientific advances. So I just wanna thank you uh, for, uh, for your attention. Uh, if you're interested in more information, the NIH website is listed here. And uh, I'm very excited to hear uh, Tyler Gibbs comments on the ethical issues that her cells and the use of her cells have raised. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rothstein. Oh my goodness, yes. lots of great information. Um, Mr. Germain? Yeah, I was just gonna say thank you so much, Tom. That was a very um, great presentation and you actually got my mind to thinking about some, some of the, um, you know, it's so much that her cells have, have uh, accomplished in the world. And one of the things, I'm um, not sure if you had mentioned this in your presentation or not, but I mean, her cells are responsible for in vitro fertilization. Yes. Her, her cells are the only cell line that clones. Yes. 
So I remember being in middle school, I think I was a seventh grader, and there was this sheep named Dolly. And it was the first sheep that was cloned. And it is because of this cell line that scientists were able to do that. So it is just phenomenal what her cells have been able to accomplish. So just wanted to mention that, but thanks again. Absolutely agreed. And and a strange quirk of fate that um, it was Dr. Jones who also was involved in in vitro fertilization um, in, uh, in a university in Virginia. And in another quirk of fate is that, um, as it turns out, in retrospect, I realized that um, Dr. Jones' daughter, Georgiana Jones, was a classmate of mine in medical school at Duke. So we knew that her, doc- her parents were doctors, but I didn't think anything of it until I, until I read uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, and they mentioned you know, Howard Jones at Hopkins. And, and I remembered that her, her father was a, a physician uh, in Baltimore. And I looked it up and yep. Uh, <laughs> so sort of a fun fact. And Dr. Rothstein, or just a couple of comments and questions in the chat here. Um, let's see, there's one question here. Uh, have other cell lines been discovered that are um, so amazingly vigorous? Um, no. I mean, there are other cell lines and they do propagate and expand, typically more slowly. Mm. Um, and, and we've used the other cell lines, but HeLa cells are, are so, uh, I guess you would say versatile in what they can do and they mimic normal cells. I don't know why, because they are, you know, they're abnormal, they're malignant, but in many of their characteristics, they mimic normal cells. And so, as I mentioned, we were doing a study of protein aggregation, which really has has nothing to do with cancer. There's nothing to do with immunology. Um, It's a side project in our lab, but we needed to transfect cells what do we grab? We grab HeLa cells um, because they are so easy to manipulate and so versatile. So there are other cell lines that people use for other purposes, but you know, to carry the analogy further, um, you know, cars can do everything. There are some situations in which you might want a Rolls Royce to drive the queen around. There are some situations in which you might want an electric car Okay, I understand that, but if, you know, just run run of the mill experiments. You're going to grab HeLa cells. That's how important they are. Wow, um, Dr. Dixon mentions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rothstein. This was amazing. Um, I learned more about the discoveries. Um, Angela says thanks for all the information. And then we have a question from Michelle. Um, Have we been able to identify what makes them so unique? And you may have answered this a little bit and why they have the ability to do with these, um, to do all these different things. Actually, no, I mean, it's controversial. Uh, There are a couple of papers that said it's due to overactive telomerase. Telomerase, um, as cells age, as people age, the ends of their chromosomes uh, sort of deteriorate and contract and the chromosomes become a little bit smaller at the ends. And those are the telomeres, the ends of the chromosomes. And telomerase replaces what's lost. So when you have active telomerase, your chromosomes won't shrink. And, and, you know, years ago that was thought, oh, that's the secret of of anti-aging. so it's thought that maybe there's a couple of papers saying that that's why uh, the cells can propagate forever. But there's also a couple of papers saying, no, 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 that's not it at all. So, but, but I think it's unknown at this point. Wow. Um, Teresa, I know you were talking a little bit about 
the variety, like the versatile of the sales sheet. Um, Teresa mentions uh, or asks, do they do they know why they are so versatile? I don't think so. Uh, and, and why they mimic human cells in so many characteristics, which shouldn't be, right? Because they're cancerous. They, why should they mimic normal cells? But they do behave in many respects like uh, normal cells. Um, no, I don't think it's known. Okay. And the second part of Teresa's question was, um, do they know the versatility? Um, like, is it related to cancer or her genetics? It's, it, it's, really, it's really unknown. Okay. <laughs> but you can see in terms of versatility, mm -hmm. uh, what was the first cell line, as was mentioned in the video, sent to space? To, to look, I mean, of course, now we can send people to space and see what happens to them. But to start, you might want to start with a cell. And so you'd want a cell that, you know, is sort of like normal cells. And that's where HeLa comes in. <laughs> um, Jermaine mentions, uh, it's, a, it's a God gift is what the family would say. Yeah, smiley face. <laughs> And Henrietta Lacks is yet another hidden figure. Absolutely. Yes, but hopefully hidden no more. Yeah. But, it, I, you know, it is strange that for so many years, um, Hila was said to stand for, for Helen Lane. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, and, and, and as I mentioned, I know it from my own personal history. That's what I was told when I first, as a college student, was in the lab. So, uh, but I hopefully hidden no more. I'm sure there are many, many more hidden figures. And, and that's why I wanted to, to be honest, that's why I wanted to call attention to, to Dr. Brown and Dr. Henderson, uh, their role in all this. I mean, they, they, in a way they are a little bit hidden. I mean, I don't think you hear very much about how they expanded HeLa cells, the innovations they made in quality control and their contribution to polio vaccine. You know, we, we hear a lot about Jonas Salk. Yes, I mean, there was a lot of basic science there, but in terms of clinical science, in terms of studying the effectiveness of the vaccine, it couldn't have been done without Drs. Brown and Henderson. And of course they built on what Booker D. Washington and George Washington Carver developed at Tuskegee University. I, you know, I, and so I, I certainly felt uh, as I looked through this, that, uh, you know, doctors Brown and Henderson were in, could be maybe even considered in that category of, of hidden figures. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm just agreeing with you, Michelle, too, um, that this that, that the misinformation just astounds me. So absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for presenting this information. Um, I mean, we all agree of how, you know, just how striking it is to us and how much we've learned and discovered um, through this. So thank you so much again, Dr. Ralph Stein. It's my pleasure, thank you. Okay, wonderful. Um, and if you, if there are more questions, you know, feel free to ask the chat. And I just wanna remind you all, you know, you feel free to come off mute. Um, we're gonna move to our um, last presenter. Um, and before we do that, again, I'm just going to share my screen one um, for a quick second, um, just so you all will have the CE credit. Uh, hopefully, get to the right screen here. Okay. Um, hopefully, you all can see this, the HeLa Sales uh, for Henrietta Lacks event. And um, this is the activity code. And the directions are just below. And you do have up to 12 hours to um, submit. And I will um, 
add my email address to the chat. And then also um, many of you have asked, um, there will be a, a copy of the recording that will be available after afterwards. Um, and then also I will send out a survey uh, that you could just let us know how we're doing. And most of the resources will be added to that survey as well. Okay, wonderful. All right, so last we have um, Dr. Tyler Gibb. He is an assistant professor um, in the program of medical ethics, humanities and law here at WMED. Um, he is also the vice chair of the um, IRB. Um, he has authored a number of publications, including peer reviews, um, law review articles on clinical bioethics, health law and research ethics. Dr. Gibbs' research interests include the intersection of health law and um, clinical ethics, medical um, neurology. Dr. Gibbs, you're gonna have to tell us a little bit about that. Um, the politics of medicine, medical ethics, uh, cross-cultural ethics, uh, pediatric ethics, in neuroethics, um, he has orchestrated quite a few of a number of diverse um, book, book club discussions here at WMED and even um, partnered with um, several of our uh, movie theaters to host um, movies that reflect and um, cover a lot that's mentioned about um, ethics and integrity. Um, so now I introduce to you, Dr. Tyler Gibb. Thank you, Candace. Um, this has really been a fascinating um, panel to be on, um, to sit and to listen. I think that there are certain names that come up quite often in medicine or in education, uh, medical education, that we think that we know about. Um, but, and I think Henrietta Lacks is one of those uh, names that comes up. And we, we all think that we know the story by now. But I think uh, today's discussion really highlights how much we really don't know about the backstory and about the implications of it. So uh, it's, a, it's a privilege for me to be able to share some thoughts here at the end of this, um, uh, this presentation. So thank you to Candice and, and your team for organizing it and uh, Mr. Jackson and uh, Dr. Rothstein for, for your comments. Um, just as a side note, it, it occurred to me that we have all been impacted um, by the legacy of Henrietta Lacks. And in my personal life, I, one of my earliest memories is is traveling and spending time with my grandmother. And from the time that I could remember, grandma always walked really slow. And my grandpa and I would we, we'd go out and play ball in the yard or um, he would be uh, pushing us in the swings or chasing us around the, on the trampoline. Um, and grandma always sat on the on the back porch and she always laughed and she always enjoyed it, but she, ne she never walked and she never walked around. She didn't chase us. And when we'd go out, she was always, someone ha was always had to be on her arm and somebody always had to be the one to, to kind of uh, walk with grandma. And it wasn't until later until I kind of uh, learned more about what uh, was going on is that I, I realized that she had actually contracted polio when she was a child and she uh, for her entire life was very much disabled by by that experience and and so that just um, you know just a, a personal touch point so I'm going to share my screen I don't have many slides um, I have a lot of thoughts but not many slides and so that's kind of how I roll so I'm going to share my screen here and I think uh, what I want to do for a few minutes is just take a step back and and talk about medicine in context uh, in its historical context. And just like Henrietta Lacks is a name that we all know, if we think back about our medical education or the, the, the individuals who have shaped what we know as medicine now, a lot of names come to mind. Hippocrates, Galen, um, Volusius, um, Osler perhaps, um, and then more contemporary, Jenner, Salk was mentioned a couple of times, Fleming, Elizabeth Blackwell, Rosalinda Franklin, um, so there's all these names that are that have really shaped the course or the trajectory of what medicine has come to 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 develop into. And one of the things that is fascinating from my perspective as somebody who studies the philosophy of medicine and the 
the ethical or moral implications of what medicine, the practice of medicine is, is that during all of this time, there was an ongoing discussion about who a physician is, and even more specifically, what a good physician ought to do in any given circumstance. And this is where ethics or moral philosophy really has um, something to say about medicine. And some of the earliest uh, iterations of, of healthcare or caring for individuals who are ill uh, have some sort of code of ethics or they have some sort of principles attached to them about what physicians ought to do and also what they ought not to do. And probably the most famous one is from uh, historically from uh, Hippocrates and, and the oath of Hippocrates, the Hippocratic oath, where he says that we, uh, to do no harm, that's where that, that principle comes. And if you look at the history of, of when Hippocrates was developing his ideas about medicine, the idea of this oath is really important because what he does or, or the, the context of the development of this oath and, and what became known as the swearing of the Hippocratic oath what Hippocrates was doing was drawing a bright line between what he conceived of as being a physician and what other people were doing at that time. And so by, by making declarations like, we'll do no harm, um, we'll pr protect the confidence of my patients, I will not um, uh, perform uh, abortions, and, and these other things that at the time were outside of the norm of what medicine was. And so he was reestablishing or making a claim about what a good physician ought to be. This pattern of, of declaring what your ethical principles are uh, repeats throughout history. So one of the earliest codes of ethics as, as we kind of know it uh, within medicine was written by Thomas Percival in 1794. And he reiterated many of the principles that uh, were, are, can be found in the, the oath of the Hippocratic Oath. It may surprise you to know that the American Medical Association's first code of ethics was written in 1847. So 20 years, almost 20 years before even the Civil War. And at that time, the practice of medicine was very, very different than what we know of, know of it today. It is a rapidly changing, re very dynamic um, profession that is intrinsically related to the development of science and development of technology and, and innovation. One thing that doesn't change or hasn't changed is this idea of to do no harm. It is seen as the first principle of medical ethics that of all the things we do, we ought not to harm people. And I think that that is a persistent theme throughout um, all of these codes of ethics and all the, the principles of ethics are really founded upon this first one for a specific reason. And that reason is that medicine has the power or the position to do a significant amount of harm. And without that um, caution from the very outset of when medical students uh, swear the oath or, or take upon them the, the Hippocratic oath to do no harm, I think that that's what really is, is at the heart of that, is that there is a, a significant amount of harm that can be done through medicine or through the auspices of medicine. So recognizing that the, the first principle of medicine is to do no harm, how do we then begin to think about all of the times in which a physician has harmed a patient? And sometimes I ask my students or I ask a group of people that I'm, I'm talking to, is it ever ethical to intentionally inflict avoidable harm onto your patients? And of course, when people think about it, the, the, the first reaction is, no, of course not. It would not that, that, that it's not, the, that not something that a good physician ought to do. But that's not right because physicians intentionally inflict avoidable harm on their patients every single day. So my, my daughter recently just broke her arm. Actually, she just got her cast off the other day. So as the doctor was examining her, her arm um, in order to make a diagnosis and to, to actually care for her, he was manipulating it and she was not happy about that. She was suffering significant pain and harm at that time. It was avoidable. The doctor need not have done that. 
I didn't do that to her because it, there was no good, good reason for me to do that. So it was avoidable harm that the physician was intentionally afflicting upon this child. So if we think about it in kind of general terms, that would be ab abhorrent. It'd be something that we would uh, resist and, and you know, call the authorities and somebody is harming this child. So then how does that make sense for a physician to do that? And the answer is that that makes sense. That's ethical. It's good behavior. It's actually behavior that we encourage and that we, we want physicians to do because there's a good outcome. There's a good justification for that. And the answer to my previous question is, it's okay, it's ethical to commit or to per, um, perpetrate avoidable harm upon individuals if there's a good justification for it. It's not ethical and, and, and it would be abhorrent to needlessly inflict harm upon people. And sometimes we're not quite sure whether uh, the intervention is worth the cost of the harm. And so for example, an, another example would be in the realm of cancer treatment. Oncologists create the situation in which patients suffer significantly to the point that their hair is falling out, that they're nauseous, that sometimes the treatment is very, very hard for these patients. And the only reason that that makes sense or the only justification is that there's a good outcome to be purchased by that suffering. And if there is no more good outcome to be purchased by that, that harm, then it's no longer ethical. It's no longer good medicine. It's merely harm is um, kind of a philosophical way of, of putting it. And so out of this first principle of do no harm, there some people have written about different principles, other principles that kind of are the root of medical ethics. One of them is to be respectful of the person themselves, to treat the person as a whole whole individual and to respect their autonomy and their freedom and their rights to direct their lives in the ways that they see fit. So respecting people's autonomy is a principle. Another principle is to maximize benefit. If there is a good to be had, let's have as much good of that as we can. Also to, to minimize harm and also to be, to be just and to treat people and particularly from a from a population perspective or a community perspective, let's be just in the way that we allocate these precious, scarce resources. So one group of people doesn't benefit unnecessarily at the expense of another person. So these four principles have, has, have kind of been codified or kind of been um, raised up as the primary principles of medical ethics, but there are a lot of other ones. Um, there are, if they're not called principles, maybe we can call them precepts of medical ethics confidentiality, the way that we treat the information, the, the intimate and sometimes sacred information that we are entrusted with as physicians, the way that we treat that is important, the way that we handle that information. Also, to be worthy of trust. So the physician and patient have this intimate, sacred relationship at some times. The physician will know things about a patient that nobody else on this earth knows. Surgeons, for example, will see parts of your body that not even you have seen. And so this is a sacred, this is an intimate relationship. And physicians ought to be worthy of that trust. So maintaining trust, but also being worthy of trust, being trustworthy is a precept of, of, of medical ethics. And so as we start to think about the, the other reasons or When we think about the harm that can be perpetuated by medicine, and not just clinical medicine, but as, as we've talked about throughout this afternoon, the, the harm possible to be perpetuated through clinical research, through medical research, is significant. And there must be a way for us to get around this, this idea of harming. Um, and, and the way that it, it is developed over the years is through this idea of consent. Um, so if you think about consent as a, uh, just as a general principle, consent is merely permission, permission to do something. And so if we were in, in person, I, the example that I would do is I would walk up to somebody and I would put my arm on their shoulder. And it's a seemingly innocuous gesture. It's, it's not done with any uh, ill intent, but it is me imposing my body upon somebody else. And in law, in, in common law, that act, the act of 
touching somebody's physical body with your body, regardless of your intent, without their permission, is actually a cause of action. It's a crime. And the crime that is, is battery. So if we are touching any individuals without permission, we are committing not only a criminal offense, but a moral offense. We are invading their personal integrity. We are imposing our will upon them in a way that doesn't respect their autonomy. It could cause harm. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why battery and also so assault and battery get combined often. But just merely touching somebody can be, a, can be a, an offense, uh, a moral and criminal offense. Physicians are not excluded from this idea of battery. Just because you are a physician and wearing a white coat and have a stethoscope around your neck does not mean that you have permission to touch people. Does not mean you have permission to examine their bodies or sometimes or have permission to ask them very sensitive questions about themselves. And so the idea has developed through case law, um, specifically a case called Schloendorf in the early 1900s, where a woman went in to have a procedure done, to have an exploratory um, uh, uh, abdominal surgery. But she said specifically, if you, if you find something, don't take it out, right? I, I want to be involved in the decision about the treatment. So whatever you find, we don't know what it's going to be, but I want to be a part of that conversation. The physician opened her up, found a very easily excisable tumor and excised it. She was, she did well, fairly well postoperatively, no, no significant complications, but she still filed a lawsuit against the, the physician because he had done something to her body that he did not have permission to do. And this is the, the Supreme Court case that has developed into what we know as uh, consent or medical consent. The, the trouble with consent is that, especially early days, we didn't know how much consent or how much information somebody needed to have in order to give consent. Was it enough for him just to say, trust me, and I'll, I'll, I'll take you in my arms and I will do the best that I can for you as a physician? Is it necessary? Would it have been necessary for her to know every single um, possible risk or bad outcome or complication that might befall her prior to it. So this idea of how informed informed consent must be um, is something that has also been developing over uh, throughout the last um, several decades. So this brings us, I guess, to the question of the, the ways and the way in which popular culture and a lot of even the uh, the academic literature around the Henrietta Lacks case has developed. So there are many different issues that one could talk about when we're talking about the Henrietta Lacks story. Um, so I, I'm gonna try really intentionally to not use it as a, to say the Henrietta Lacks case because it's not just a case of anything, but it is really this, this rich narrative that we've heard. So there are plenty of ethical issues that we can talk about, it, informed consent, commercialization and compensation, privacy and confidentiality, intersections between race and poverty and health disparities, familial implications of genetic information, and specifically, like um, was just mentioned, the, the protections against your genetic information or your family's genetic information being made public and the ramifications for that and the protections of that. The question about biospecimens, if, you, if I have a piece of my body excised from me, cut, out, cut away from me, do I, is that still me? Is that little bit of tissue, is that still something that I have ownership over? Should I have ownership over it? Is it something that I should have control over? Um, so I had my tonsils removed um, during graduate school, which is a very painful experience. Um, but this, it, it raised the question of who owns those tonsils? Is it a you broke it, you buy it kind of situation where the physician or the hospital owns it and they can do with whatever they want to? Um, if for whatever reason my tonsils were particularly interesting clinically or from a research perspective, would I be able to go back and try to um, make some sort of claim about the, the research that was done because of my tonsil tissue? None of that stuff was the case, but clearly that was the case in the, the Henrietta Lacks story. So 
one concept that I want to, to bring up that also further complicates the story of Henrietta Lacks and her family is this idea of intersectionality. So this is a term that was coined or created by Kimberly Williams Crenshaw in the uh, early 90s, particularly in context of legal research. So she's a, a law professor. At, uh, she was at Harvard. I'm not quite sure if she's still there yet, uh, still there. But she talked about intersectionality and the vulnerabilities we all have from the intersection of the different identities, the different categories that we all inhabit. So if um, so Kimberly Crenshaw, um, for example, uses uses the example of her um, her gender, uh, her female gender, and also being an, uh, a black woman and also being from a certain um, you know, political affiliation and, or from a certain uh, philosophical discipline and also from where she is from and her health. Um, her health status and, and all of these things kind of overlap in this Venn diagram of, of, of multiple vulnerabilities and strengths. And um, it's an interesting metaphor about how humanity and the lived experience is such a rich um, intersection between all of these different identities. A quote that I, I really enjoy from, I really like from one of my uh, professors in grad school was that he said that people don't go into categories without remainder. And I think it's that remainder that Kimberly Crenshaw is really focusing on. And so if we think about the Henry Leanna Lack story, of course it was a, an issue of, um, uh, of race during the 1940s, 1950s, particularly in Baltimore. So there was a racial aspect. There was a geographic aspect of being from the wrong side of the, the town in Baltimore. There was a, a disparity in the power between the white uh, male physicians at Johns Hopkins, which is one of the still is one of the world's um, preeminent healthcare institutions, but also that she was only seen in the quote unquote colored clinic, right? And so all of these intersecting aspects of this story really coalesce into um, the rich, the rich, robust narrative that we've heard um, from Mr. Um, Germain and also Dr. Rothstein. And so my question is, um, was this avoidable? Was there something about the way that the, the story progressed that if we were to go back, it would have been done differently today? And I guess the, the answer that I come to is that I'm not certain that it, it would be any different, which is troubling. Um, one of my other favorite, uh, uh, another author that I really enjoy is, her name is Dorothy Roberts, and she's a, a law professor at Penn. And she wrote a book called The Fatal Invention, which was a, a book about the social constructedness of race and the way in which race gets um, treated uh, in society as something being more real than, than perhaps it is. And in one of her chapters, she ends by talking about um, stereotypes in medicine. And she, she has, th there's this quote that I'm just gonna read. So before Henrietta Lacks died of cervical cancer in 1951 in a quote, colored patient ward at Johns Hopkins Charity Hospital, a doctor cultured the cells from her cervix without her consent. Her cells known by scientists as HeLa had the amazing ability to reproduce endlessly and prolifically providing material for more than 60,000 scientific studies that contribute to a wealth of medical advances from the polio vaccine to chemotherapy to in vitro fertilization. While the HeLa cells enabled a lucrative biomedical industry, the lax children who were not informed for decades about the fate of her mother's tissue struggled with inadequate healthcare. And so two, two parts of this quote that I want to highlight and kind of focus in on is that without her consent and we're not informed part of it. And I think what Dorothy Roberts and, and many, not just Dorothy, but other people have talked a lot about, you know, if there was consent given, but for consent, this wouldn't have happened. And I don't know that that's true. And um, we're going to talk about that in just a minute. It is the case that in the 1950s, particularly with the racial dynamic that was going on between um, you know, and still going on, the, there was institutional racism. There was institutional uh, structural inequalities between um, particularly Henrietta Lacks specifically, and also um, millions of Americans who were 
experiencing uh, similar disparities of healthcare. One thing that we ha we need to be careful of when we are when we whenever we look back on previous um, generations and the way that they dealt with um, medical ethics issues or ethical issues in general is to be careful not to take what what our current norms are so our current ideas about how things ought to go and apply them retroactively to those situations. There are cases, and um, many of you are very familiar with these cases, where regardless of what circumstances or regardless of what context was occurring at that time, the action was un indefensible. So we think about the, the, the medical experimentations under Joseph Mengele during the World War II. Regardless of the context, it's completely indefensible. Um, the Tuskegee syphilis study, it's another one that it, that often comes up, regardless of what the circumstances of the the cultural milieu at the time that those experiments were being conducted. There is no justification either at the time or now that that would make what happened to those individuals um, okay. And I guess the question is then: Is this more a situation like those where? The doctors may not have known that they were doing something wrong. They may not have known that they sh that they um, ought to have involved Henrietta or her family in this decision to to collect these cells. Or is it a situation where they didn't know, but maybe they should have known? Um, and so, since the the public attention has really focused on the Henrietta Locke story, um, thanks not only to uh, the book from um, uh, that was mentioned earlier, but also after this, the the story has become more popular. There have been policy and rules changes, um, but I guess the, the the question that I continue to have is whether those rule changes would actually have made a difference for Henrietta and her family back in the day, and I'm not sure that they would have. And so, just a little bit of of research ethics, um, history of research ethics, to kind of wrap up here. So in the United States, federal regulations, which also known as the common rule, were developed in response to revelation, re, sorry, in response to revelations of extreme research abuse of very vulnerable populations, specifically the Tuskegee study. Or if you are familiar with um, Henry Beecher, who wrote uh, a paper chronicling the misconduct of research um, in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. So these regulations, so the common rule, were designed primarily to protect human beings from physical risks involved in ongoing experimental research. So these, these rules, the common rule set forth provisions for informed consent and also oversight by institutional review boards, what we call IR, you know, IRBs now. With very limited exceptions, these must apply and they do apply to all federally funded research. So in terms of application to biospecimen research, so specifically in reference to the cells that were taken without consent from Henrietta Lacks, the common rule, the federal regulations which govern this define a human subject as a, li as a living individual about whom an investigator, so a researcher, obtains either data through direct intervention with them, direct interaction with the individual, or that that sample or that um, biospecimen is identifiable to that individual. So when an investigator interacts with a person to, com to collect biospecimen specifically for research, um, informed consent and IR IRB oversight are required. However, when an investigator only relies upon the biospecimen that has already been collected for another purpose, so for a clinical purpose, for example, diagnosis, if the investigator is only interacting with the biospecimen that has previously been collected, no intervention or interaction according to the rules, there is no interaction or intervention with an individual to with a person. Also, 
Uh, and so if there's no inter interaction between the investigator and the individual, it's not considered to be human subjects research. And therefore the, the protections that have developed over the years, as far as IRBs and informed consent rules and um, all of these other apparatuses that have developed around uh, human subjects research don't apply in those situations. And there, over the last several years, the, the federal regulations and the common rule have been updated to include uh, identifiability as an aspect of when informed consent must be made. But if you think about the ways in which most of this research progresses, they utilize what's often called uh, biobanks or biospecimen banks, where an institution like Mayo, Mayo Clinic, for example, so they are doing diagnoses, biopsies, they're collecting samples of blood and tissue and fluid all the time throughout all of their sites across the country. And as they are utilizing that material for clinical diagnosis and prognosis and treatment plans, there's always residual. And the question comes up, what do we do with that residual? And what a lot of institutions have done with the blessing of the, the, the federal government and the regulatory bodies is that they take the, that remainder sample and put it into a, a, a data bank or a, a bio bank where it can be used for subsequent research. And so under the, under the conditions where there's, it's purely using a bio bank and specifically that there's no interaction between an individual and the researcher, the research, like I said, is determined to be not human subject research and informed consent isn't required. So if Henrietta Lacks were to go into a clinic today at Johns Hopkins or Mayo or Cleveland Clinic or any other place across the country and were to have the same condition and was to have her cervix sampled or biopsied for, for diagnostic purposes, it's still possible that her tissue would be put to research use. And the struggle that we have about informed consent, um, despite its, its historical underpinnings, is that we're, we still don't quite know how to ask for or how someone can validly give informed consent to that process. Um, and so, so if Henrietta Lacks were a patient today, biospecimens would be collected for her clinical care that would require her, her, her consent. Um, obviously she would have to be involved in that process, but it's not clear and it's not consistent that she would be asked to provide consent for future research or for ongoing research, because sometimes those research projects aren't even conceived of yet. And it takes a, uh, creativity beyond the scope of um, the people who are seeking consent from her to actually be able to articulate what in the future her cells might be used for. And the Henrietta Lack story really bears that out. It, it would be inconceivable um, for somebody in the 1950s to imagine all of the different ways in which her cells might be used. And so I guess my my concern or the issues that I think are, are perpetuating or, or ongoing here are that sh sh despite the, the story and the concern about informed consent and then also going back and if, if a discovery is made based upon this, uh, this research um, on any, any individual's biospecimen or their, their sample, what obligations do the researchers have to go back and try to de-identify or to try to re-identify um, who actually donated it and, and whether there are implications for their family, whether financially or clinically. Um, and so the, I guess what I'm doing and, and my concern and, and where, where I'll end up with uh, my thoughts are that these, these issues are often much more complicated and continuing to be more complicated as we uh, try to think through the implications of what they what they are, and so I, I'm I'm grateful for the for the lessons taught by the Henrietta Lacks story. Um, I think it's encouraging, and I think that the interest that the public has in these particular types of questions is really important. Um, and as Dr. Rothstein mentioned, um, there there are there have been 
some really great strides made by uh, pharmaceutical companies specifically and the NIH to try to be more careful about the way that this information is used and to, to go back and to try to connect with the family and, and um, involve them in the process moving forward. Um, I think better consent may be an answer, but I, it can't be the only answer. And I think one thing that we need to remember, particularly as we're engaging in clinical research and, and clinical care, is that this is not a, the person sitting in front of you is, is really that, they are a person. And they are not just a, uh, an amalgamation or a combination of interesting um, organ systems or tissues or cells. And that by, by taking the, the humanity of the person out of the, of, of the calculation, what we're doing is really doing an act of violence against this individual. And so when Dr. Rothstein was talking about him being told that this was uh, Helen Lane's cells, that really is, that's a, a, that is a depersonalizing act of violence. It's something that we need to be um, careful about and we need to be, uh, we need to oppose and we need to uh, rehumanize uh, the practice of, of clinical research. Um, and so I guess my dad accuses me, um, he says that people like me just muddy the waters to give the impression of depth. And, I, and th maybe that's what I'm doing here is I'm just muddying the waters and, and raising concerns without answers. Um, but I, I am also reminded of what my, one of my mentors said once that the whole endeavor of ethics or moral philosophy or um, medical ethics is really two things. It's one to help clinicians to f or individuals engaged in this, whether it's researchers or nurses or physicians to help you find your voice and not just any voice, but your moral voice, which is different and it's important. So it's the, the endeavor that we ought to take upon ourselves is to find our own moral voice and what is important to us, but then also at the same time, and perhaps perhaps important is to listen for and to hear the moral voice of other people. And the thing that strikes me the most about this case is it seems as if, and, and maybe this is just me at the end of a, a, a long week, um, envisioning the, the moral voice of Henrietta Lacks crying out from the grave about the injustices done to um, to her during her lifetime, but also the, the injustice is done to her throughout uh, her legacy and, and the time after her death. And I, I really applaud Rebecca Sloot, uh, Sloot to you know, hearing the calling of this, um, of this story and being able to articulate it in a way that has given new life to it and put a spotlight back on um, the area or on the woman that we really should be honoring more than we do. So uh, with that, I, I'll turn, the, turn the, the microphone back over to you, Candace. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gibb. That was amazing. Um, and I just want to comment on your, your uh, images there. Like <laughs> that was striking in itself. Um, there is a comment from Teresa. She uh, mentions that she's been doing clinical research for the past 14 years. Um, so she completely agrees that going back and tracking biospecimens would be a nightmare. However, um, she does guess that um, she would hope that in current cases where we do know where tissue has come from, then proper consent will be, be obtained. Thank you, Teresa. Um, is, are there any um, more questions or questions or comments um, for Dr. Gibb? And feel free to unmute yourself. Can I ask a question? Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, so um, the development of HeLa cells was handled uh, you might say informally. Uh, they were uh, cultured, then they were sent out to a lot of places. There was no patent um, by uh, Dr. Gay or by Hopkins. So my question is, uh, 
had Gay or Hopkins patented this or received money for it, would that have changed the situation or the power structure? Would the Lax family then have been able to um, pursue um, uh, credit, uh, financial advantages, or other forms of, of recognition if it had been done formally in that way? Yeah. So what's interesting about the, the issue of a patent is that in order to go through the, the work of filing for a patent, you have to be either fairly sure or at least have the suspicion that whatever you're doing is going to be financially via, um, beneficial. And my understanding of the, the story um, was that Dr. Gay didn't have that inclination. Or if he did, it, he, he thought that it was um, you know, something that he, he shouldn't pursue for whatever reason. And so I think that if you are interacting with somebody and you and there is a belief or an expectation or even a hope that there's going to be some monetization of this person's um, uh, specimens or, or, or something uh, from their body, then that would require a heightened level of consent, right? Um, proactively. So one of the one of the ideas of consent that is is difficult to to rep to you know to to think about or just to discuss it with any kind of detail is the different types of consent. And there, here's a slide. I'll just share this briefly. Um, that comes from this really good paper talking about the legacy of, of Henry de Lacks. And so this is, so going from top to bottom, the different degrees of consent. And at the top of the, the, the image, top of the table is no consent at all. And I don't know that that was, that, that Henry de Lacks was actually in that area of no consent whatsoever. It was probably more of an area of general notification that, you know, here are things that we're going to do. Yeah possibly not even um, talking about research, but that general consent and, and blanket consent, broad consent, those are all still um, methodologies or approaches that we use today, even if we do think that there's gonna be research in the future. What's also interesting about the Henrietta Lacks story is that unlike so many other biospecimen samples that, that are actively being researched today, this can actually be traced back to an individual and that has different implications um, because not only, like you said, the, the implication financially, not to a, a amorphous anonymous group of individuals, even a, a group of individuals that are, are that, that aren't um, anonymous. Like for example, there, there's been some, some research studies looking at genetic markers in certain um, Native American or First Nations uh, groups where, although we don't know exactly which individual member of the tribe the sample came from, we can trace it back to that, to that, uh, that group of people. And so there's been compensation or inclusion or sensitivity to that um, uh, in that way. So in my, my approach, my, my, suggestion or my thought is that if there is the possibility or the expectation or even the hope of significant financial remuneration above and beyond what is kind of the, the normal, then that entails a heightened level of obligation on the researcher. And part of that obligation is a heightened level of informed consent um, uh, at the outset. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. And, um, uh, Tyler, can you talk a little bit more about um, like patent biological samples like such as this? Is that something that can be done? So intellectual property is not uh, my area of specialization, but I, I in, in general terms, there are certain things that you cannot patent. And one of those is, so you cannot patent things that are naturally occurring in, in nature. Um, so I, I can't patent a tree if I really like the tree, right? Because I didn't, there was nothing about my, my skill or my industry or my interaction with that thing that changed it in a way 
that um, took it out of being just a naturally occurring, occurring phenomenon. And so we, we see this sometimes with, um, like for example, genetically modified seeds um, for agriculture. So if it's just the seed, you can't patent the seed. But if you do something, if you tweak it in some way and change it, so whatever the seed is now doesn't occur in nature, it only occurs because of your intervention, then that is patentable, right? So you've imposed some sort of um, change, fundamental change to it. Therefore, you ought to have protection, intellectual property protection for that thing. Um, whether that is good or bad or, or right or wrong, or there are clear clear lines that can be drawn is, is a different matter. But in general, it it's you may not patent a, a naturally occurring phenomenon, a naturally occurring um, thing. Um, there has to be some sort of um, intervention in some way. And so that's what, that that's kind of the fine line that, that these types of research projects have to have to kind of walk is because so the question then is the HeLa cells that are able to be reproduced is that ha, has something been done to that cell line in order to make it uh, into what it is or is this just purely like um, you know Mr. Jackson said earlier is this purely a gift of God that this is a naturally self-perpetuating line of, of cells. And so that, that's what an intellectual property uh, lawyer or a, um, somebody who works in IP would, would be uh, concerned about is whether it, it is a naturally occurring phenomenon, even if it is you know, a one in a million or one in a trillion occurrence, but also whether it's a, um, something has been done to it such that it should be able to be patented. I don't know if that answered your question. I kind of doubt it. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I share, yeah, I'm sure, Michelle, you're, <laughs> that answered your, your, your question. Um, feel free to come off mute um, if you do others, if you do have questions. Um, as I'm talking, you, you know, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I was just going to mention that um, Jennifer did state that um, Henry, the, um, the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks um, is chosen as W. Man's Common Read um, title for September. And Jennifer, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. I mean, is that open to the free and open to the public? Mm -hmm. Hi, it is not open to the public, uh, but we, but some of our academic partners are welcome. So WMU, the hospital staffs, and uh, WMed folks can participate. This is our annual common read that we've been doing for many years. And uh, the um, selection of the title was just made. And I'm excited to uh, dig deeper into this topic. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, and I also was just going to mention, you know, feel free to unmute me with anyone. Um, I'm sorry, feel free to unmute and ask questions as I'm talking. Um, I just wanted to just mention that, um, you know, all of our events um, that we do host, um, I can share that with our, um, the survey that I'll distribute. Um, so there will, there will be a link. We just launched our uh, website. So I'm like, excited about that <laughs> um, where you can go to the website and you can see about all our events that we are hosting um, WMed has a calendar of events as well as a whole too that you you will have access to um, if you're um, you know external from uh, WMed um, but we definitely you know welcome you all and um, appreciate you all being here today um, this is just uh, amazing. I I am just I am just speechless, but I am um, so proud um, to be a part of this uh, organization and proud to be a part of this event today. Um, and I'll just pause for a second just to see if there are any more questions for Dr. Gibb or any of our presenters. Thank you so much. Um, so now I will, oh, this see, great, great. I'm glad I, we, we have that long, awkward pause. This is good. This is the um, instructor in me. 
<laughs> um, can this be viewed later? Absolutely. Great question, Andrea. Um, so I will usually what we do, um, our communication team uploads our all our recordings to our YouTube page. Um, so you just reminded me, I'm gonna, I'll put post that in the chat along with my email. And um, right after this, we do, you know, of course, we do receive a, a recording link. Um, so if you're interested and uh, would like that link, uh, feel free to email me, email me and I can send that to you. Um, or you can, um, you know, if you would like to wait for the YouTube um, recording um, to be uploaded, you, you know, that will be available as well, most likely next week. So um, yeah, we're definitely open and thank you for asking that question. And now um, I will turn it over to um, Dr. Cheryl Dixon. She is the Associate Dean for Health Equity and Community um, Affairs. And she is actually the visionary for this event along with many others. Dr. Dixon. First of all, I just want to thank our presenters. I can't thank you enough. Thank you, Jermaine, for um, you know working with us, and thank you so much, Dr. Tom Rothstein, and thank you so much, Dr. Tyler Gibb. This was um, amazing and really um, gave me more information and and made me want to really do more research. I've read that book by Rebecca Skluth. I've seen the movie. I've actually read some articles, but I learned something from this presentation. So thank you so much. I'm sure everyone else that joined learned a lot as well. I can't can't tell you how much um, we appreciate your time because I know it took a lot of time for you all to do this. Um, we were going to do this last year in person, <laughs> but a lot of things have changed, you know, um, but we, it was still super amazing. And uh, Jermaine, I can't thank you enough for your um, artwork and the family history and to actually have you here in Kalamazoo um, as part of the family and just sharing that so much of the story and the history is just like, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I am sure that this will be viewed for, um, you know, school kid, you know, it should be that traveling show. And this information, uh, a lot of our students were unable to attend because of uh, classes that they're in, but certainly I think that they should be able to look at the, uh, the YouTube video later because they will gain a lot from it. And so what better way to celebrate Black, Hicks, Black History Month to, than to give the history of um, the HeLa cells. So um, thank you again. Um, I'm sorry I was late coming, I was actually uh, at the gospel mission doing some work, <laughs> but, um, thank you. And, and Candace, you are an amazing facilitator and moderator. So we thank you too. Um, you are just like phenomenal. I didn't have to say anything. <laughs> so thank you again. And, um, I just appreciate you so much. And I know you spent a lot of time doing, uh, the research, both you, Dr. Gibb, Dr. Dr. Rothstein and, uh, and Jermaine and making the video you know, pulling all this together to make that video. I know you were working, on, you know, month, you know, cause we were trying to plan this, working on this months, trying to get it together to make it virtual. And it's just amazing. So thank you again. Thanks, any last words from any of all, anyone before we close out? Okay, thank you again and have a good rest of your day and, and have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for this event.